This is Self Work, and I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford. At Self Work, we'll discuss psychological and emotional issues common in today's world and what to do about them. I'm Dr. Margaret, and Self Work is a podcast dedicated to you taking just a few minutes today for your own self work. Hello, and welcome to Self Work. I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford. I'm a clinical psychologist. I've practiced out of Fayetteville, Arkansas now for 25 years. And last year, I decided to extend the walls of my practice to try to reach people who either already are interested in psychology and maybe even go to therapy and might be interested in emotional topics, psychological topics, but also to those of you out there who might never darken the door of a therapist, but are just curious enough to wonder what it'd be like to talk with someone. You know, I believe we all have our bits of wisdom, and what I have to pass on to you is the wisdom that I've learned from the patients that I've seen for 25 years. Today, we're going to be talking about suicide and the predictability of suicide, I think you're going to be surprised by some of what the research says. I recently had a mom of a daughter who had had borderline personality disorder tell me that she can't even look at signs that say suicide is preventable because she can't believe that her child actually committed suicide. It may have been accidental. It may not have been, but it's very hurtful to think that she could have prevented it. So we're going to talk some about what the research actually shows. Then I'm going to tie that in with talking about perfectly hidden depression a lot. For those of you who are return listeners, you know that that is a passion of mine, and I'm actually writing a book about it. There are all kinds of episodes interspersed within the now 74 episodes of Self Work. It starts with episode three and four, which I like to say I edited myself, and I did, so if they're not quite what some of the rest of them are, there's a reason for that. But we're going to talk a little bit about suicide and perfectly hidden depression as well. This episode of Self Work is sponsored by Audible.com. And midway through the episode, I'm going to give you a trial offer from Audible.com that actually ends up with a gift for you and a donation to St. Jude's Children's Hospital. But we'll talk more about that later. Let's move on to a discussion about suicidality. Do you believe that suicide is predictable? Basically, it's not, very sadly and tragically. Suicidal thoughts can be part of your neighbor's everyday life, your professor's daily existence, or your boss's regular mental fare. And you might never know it. And, of course, if you tend to be perfectionistic or you're afraid of mental illness stigma, then the chance is even less likely that you would reveal how you actually feel or think. Let's take a little bit of a look at the research. I'm not going to talk about this extensively, but I did find a couple of very interesting articles. This one was some research that was quoted by Dr. Michael Yapko. It was in the February issue of the Psychological Bulletin. And he quotes, the researchers conducted a meta-analysis, and what that means is they look at multiple studies rather than just one study. Okay, so the researchers conducted a meta-analysis of studies that have tried to predict suicide. It used 365 studies involving 3,428 total risk factor effect sizes, which is a statistical term that I've forgotten what it means. But anyway, there were 3,428 of them spanning the last 50 years. And what it showed was that the risk factors that we all talk about, previous suicide attempts, stressful life events, substance abuse, depression, none of those categories or even subcategories could accurately predict suicide any better than chance. That is phenomenal. Now, just one more study. A man named Gregory Simon, who's also an MD doctor, who is chair of the Scientific Advisory Board for the Depression and Bipolar Support Alliance, which is part of Kaiser Permanente's Washington Research Institute, talked about a researcher named Rajiv Ramchand, who is a senior behavioral scientist at RAND, which is basically a nonprofit research organization. So what they did, 
They embedded a small team of researchers in a coroner's office in New Orleans. And they were there to study suicide up close, not in case files or summaries, but face-to-face with people who had lost loved ones, listening to their stories. Basically, they called them psychological autopsies. So these 17 people, they asked about daily routines, relationships, health and financial problems, the presence of guns in the house or a note left behind. There was only one clear pattern that emerged. And again, I think you're going to be surprised. In almost none of the cases did the usual warning signs provide a reliable signal that a life was spiraling towards suicide. That's a quote from Dr. Simon. And you know, this has been so well publicized. We've come as a culture to believe that we can actually predict whether someone's going to commit suicide or not. But these studies show that we cannot. There's just not good research backing that up. Now, that doesn't mean that you don't pay attention to symptoms of depression or previous suicide attempts. Of course you do. But unfortunately and sadly, they do not seem to predict actual suicide. Now, for those of you who've been listening to self-work, you know that I've been talking a good deal about perfectionism. In fact, the 70th episode I called The Disease of Perfectionism. Perfectionistic people are people that you think you know. Let's take someone named Emily. What you know about Emily is she's traveling up the ladder at work. She's an extremely loyal friend. She always has time for everyone who needs it. She's fun. She's ready to go anywhere, do anything. In fact, she's always going and doing. And then let's talk about a guy named Patrick. Patrick is the guy people turn to in a crisis. He's a more than dedicated volunteer in the community. He heads up fundraisers and chairs committees. He's the guy who can make you comfortable by telling a joke or laughing at himself. But both Emily and Patrick are also perfectionists. What's the real backstory of Emily and Patrick? Emily's father used to tell her how worthless she was as she just tried to stay out of the way of his nightly drunken binges. Her mother still tells her that it wasn't all that bad and don't talk about the past. She only sleeps three hours a night and after she binges on junk food... She makes herself throw up in order to maintain some kind of control. Emily has bulimia. Patrick's mother died when he was very young, and he was told never to speak of her again. Any pictures of his mother disappeared. He was forced to call his new stepmom, who appeared five months later, mother. He watches how others so easily trust, but he cannot seem to relax. He struggles with believing that disaster is right around the corner, and he worries constantly. There's no way he can go to sleep, so he pops a Xanax nightly. What does Patrick have? Patrick has generalized anxiety disorder. But both those diagnoses are a secret. In fact, neither of these people had been to a doctor or therapist before they saw me. By the way, both of these people are people that I've seen. Of course, their names are not Emily and Patrick. But they keep their pain locked tightly away, hidden behind years of smiling and surviving. They're perfectly hiding what they perceive as a flaw or a vulnerability because mental illness to them of any kind will bring stigma and that will feel like a flaw. Researchers do understand the connection between perfectionism and suicide and have long been finding that perfectionism can live right alongside several mental illnesses. And there are major identified suicide risk factors. Those are hopelessness, impulsivity, and believing you're a burden for those you love. Yet even with these things that are known, suicide still seems to be unpredictable. And that unpredictability, I believe, is very frightening to realize. Let's talk about the free trial from Audible real quickly. Audible approached me several months ago, and other companies have approached me, but I'm not in the business of selling anything. But this particular offer seemed like a win-win to me. If you type in audibletrial.com slash selfwork, that's audibletrial.com slash selfwork, you'll get a free month's trial of Audible. And you already listen to a podcast, so you probably listen to books too. And you can get any free book you want. The one I'm suggesting on this particular topic is What Made Maddie Run by Kate Fagan. It's a wonderful book, and unfortunately and sadly, Maddie Holleran did commit suicide. 
but it's a story that needs to be told and needs to be understood. So if you do this, I do get a little bit of a compensation for that. And what I do with those is I turn that into a donation to St. Jude's, which is a cancer research hospital for children in Memphis that provides all the care, all the accommodations, everything for the child and for the family for free. So check out audibletrial.com slash selfwork. Get your free book and a free month of audible.com and you'll be giving a donation to St. Jude's. Now I want to get back to talking about perfectionism, which of course is all about control. We talked about that in episode 70. But I wanted to relate to you the real words of people who have identified with perfectly hidden depression and what they have told me about being suicidal. The first is a guy who runs a local gym, very well thought of in the community, big guy, football player kind of guy. I was very much trying to control things, but I didn't have any answers. I didn't want to tell my wife the exact thoughts I had. I was lost. Every day, I thought about driving off a bridge as I smiled and waved at customers at the same time. I finally broke. My wife made an appointment for me with a therapist, and it literally saved my life. You would never have known that this man was suicidal. Never. Here's someone else. Again, these are real people. These are their real words who've reached out to me. Until recently, I thought I had everything under control. But a year ago, I had a meltdown and sat in the garden with a gun in my mouth, determined to do it. I have no idea why I didn't. I just didn't. Outwardly, I have it all. But I'm dead inside and feel often as if I'm just going through the motions. The only thing that stopped me was my kids. Thank goodness for those kids, right? And just two more. This next one comes from a woman who emailed me these words. Five years ago, just before my 39th birthday, I was seconds away from driving my car into the path of a tractor trailer. The only thing that stopped me was seeing the driver's face. I realized he would think he killed me, and my pain would simply be transferred to him. I couldn't be responsible for that. The next day, I went to my doctor and for the first time ever spoke freely about what I learned later was anxiety and depression. I'd been seeing my doctor for over 15 years. I remember the pain in her eyes as she said, I had no idea. Why didn't you say anything? These are all people, again, who reached out to me and identified with perfectly hidden depression. But this last example I took from Dr. Simon's article. Wilkins Kearney committed suicide. It seemed to come out of nowhere for his tight circle of friends and family. Looking back now, they remember no warnings, no signs of depression, nothing but the long, solitary runs he would sometimes take when work or life got him down. He was always just the same old Wilk, a loyal friend with a streak of mischief in his grin, an active participant in life, one close friend said. He was, by all accounts, a character. And in his hometown, New Orleans, that counts for something. He used to call into sports radio talk shows, introduce himself as Catfish from Grand Isle, and then hold forth on Saints football. He cracked up the congregation in his own wedding when he ended his vows with a long and loud, Amen! His friends who had known him since kindergarten searched for something they missed. They found nothing. Wilkins Kearney left a note for his wife on the kitchen counter, propped against their wedding picture. It began, To Dear Lilla, and ended, I love you so much. And then he pulled open a drawer and took out a gun. If any of this is triggering you in any way, please talk to someone now. The National Suicide Prevention Lifeline is 1-800-273-8255. 1-800-273-8255. That link will also be in the show notes. In fact, all these articles will have links in the show notes if y'all are interested. The first three people... They now know that the revelation of their true feelings was the beginning of a personal and emotional freedom and self-compassion, but they came far too close to ending their lives, and of course, tragically, William died. 
Families need to know, however, they're not to blame. How can you catch something when nothing's changed or certainly nothing obvious? Even when there has been depression, as Michael Yapko points out, there are not huge changes in someone's behavior. It's just more of the same. And certainly people with hidden depression or perfectly hidden depression, as I've called it, nothing changes in their behavior either. If you feel this way, if you have any idea that you might hurt yourself, please risk telling someone. That's the only prevention. Someone who will respond with empathy and care. Someone who will help you get the help you need. Even if they're surprised by what you have to say. Talk to a family member, go to a doctor or a therapist. But you don't have to continue to listen to the constant self-berating and self-criticism that's inside your head if you're suicidal. If you're hopeless, if you're impulsive, if you believe yourself to be a burden, don't discount what others will have to go through that you love and that you care about. But most of all, please reach out. The email from a listener today is about relationships. He says, with my five-year relationship blowing up in my face, I've realized that I'm not over my own childhood abuse. It's made me not understand my emotions when my partner does something wrong. My two triggers are being dismissed and feeling unloved. And part of my partner's baggage is dismissal, acting somewhat emotionally distant. He also has a somewhat immature sense of balance because he spends too much time with coworkers and doesn't spend a lot of time with me. We live together and I'm torn because now I know what is wrong with me and how to fix it. I want to try again and make changes, but because of the people who've made themselves readily available to him, he thinks it would be easier to start fresh instead of addressing his own baggage. How do I talk to him to get him to understand that I'm not my trauma or my reaction? I printed out a bunch of articles for him to read since he can't understand me, and I don't mind giving him the time, but it's complicated because he's in a highly competitive academic situation and I'm in a new job. Please help. Certainly, this sounds like a very complicated relationship to people who have somewhat grown apart, and is it better to just start over, or is it better to try to work it out with the one you're with? Let's see what I answered. (laughs) Hello, I can certainly hear that this relationship is very important to you, and that you've had some revelations and made some connections that would lead to change and improvement. You're asking your partner to give you that time, But it sounds as if the message you're getting from him is that he's moved on, and he's not necessarily willing to look at his own contribution to the problems you two have had. Since you live together, and sounds like there are many other things in your life, I can certainly understand the complication. What I always tell my patients to do is to look for what you have control over. If you believe you can fix what you perceive is wrong with yourself, then I'd recommend focusing on that, whether or not you have his participation or not. It, again, is what you have control over. You don't have control over whether he's committed or not. He might have more of a chance to see the change if it's through your changed behavior, not read an article about it, although the articles were a good idea. However, the ultimate hurdle is if he doesn't make himself available to see your change. You'll have to decide where your own boundaries are there and what your own limits are and how you're being treated. If you two have been together five years, you've probably been through a good deal and maybe it's worth it. I'm sorry you're struggling, and I hope this has been helpful. I want to thank you so much for listening today to Self Work. I got all kinds of ratings last week that really made me feel great. Listenership is up. Please tell your friends about self-work. I'm very excited to tell you that next week, I'll have my very first guest on, Sarah Fader, who's written several books, mostly about depression and anxiety, although she had one bestseller, that, and it's actually how we met. Her bestseller was Three-Year-Olds Are Assholes, (laughs) so she's interesting to talk with. 
You can always leave me a rating or review wherever you listen. I love those reviews, especially because they get specific and tell me what you like and maybe what you wish you had more of, whatever it is. Constructive criticism, I welcome. You can also hop on over to my Facebook page. That's Dr. Margaret Rutherford. Oh, and I wanted to tell you, I have started a Facebook closed group. It's on my Facebook page, but it's basically facebook.com slash group slash self work. I named it the same thing as this podcast. So I'd love to have you over there as well. If you subscribe to my website at drmargaretrutherford.com, you'll get one weekly newsletter with my weekly blog post and podcast. That's it, I promise. And of course, please email me at askdrmargaret at drmargaretrutherford.com. I'll answer you whether I answer you on the podcast or not, but I love to hear from you what's going on in your lives, what struggles you're facing, and perhaps I can be helpful. So thank you so much for listening today. I know this has been a more serious topic, but suicide touches so many of our lives. And I wanted to make sure we were well educated about it. So thanks for listening. Take very good care. I'm Dr. Margaret, and this has been Self Work. <laughs>